we're standing here in the northeast of England, there is almost a mile of ice above our heads. And when there is almost a mile of ice above our heads, the, the ice melted away at the end of the ice age and created a lot of the valleys that you see around us today, including places like Jesmond Dean, the Tyne Valley, other things like that. So there was this beautiful valley here that went from where we're here, we are, where we are, I do apologise, through Northumbria University, down the course of the Central Motorway and joined the time roughly where the law courts are. So there was this massive valley here and it was considered one of the most beautiful places in the northeast of England. People would come here for holidays, for country walks, there were farms inside here and it was seen as a beautiful part of the city. And when it was a beautiful part of the city, it stayed here until 1790. And in 1790, the town council of Newcastle decided that this was in the way of Newcastle expanding to the east. So they took every single last piece of rubbish you can possibly imagine in the city and they chucked in here for 10 years. And so this entire area around here is actually one gigantic Georgian rubbish dump. And I absolutely love saying that because when you're walking around here around the civic centre, it looks green, it looks lovely, but it's actually a gigantic rubbish dump on which the civic centre is built upon. Which is quite funny in its own right. But we do know that people have been living around here for quite a long time because when they built the Kingsgate building in Newcastle University they found an Iron Age or Celtic Hill uh, roundhouse just around that area there. So people were living and farming in this area going right the way back to about 800 BC. So we know that there's been a population around here as well. Following on from that, the other street around here as well is St Mary's Place. And the reason why it's called St Mary's Place is because in the past that used to be a leper colony. Now, when you think of leprosy in TV, film, media like that today, you always think of like, the lepers being kept outside of the community and being ostracized and stuff like that. And it's true in the Middle Ages that people did want to be as far away from lepers as possible because no one knew where the disease came from. They didn't understand how it was spread or anything like that. And it was one of these terrifying diseases that suddenly could strike a population and cause massive amounts of damage to it. And it was actually not a native disease. It had been caught by many crusaders when they went over to the Holy Land. And when they came back, they then would spread it in towns and cities. But the one thing that's slightly different to how it's been living until TV and media is that a lot of people would actually go and actually go into leper colonies and look after the lepers and would provide them with really good food, look after them, wash them, care for them, and all of that sort of stuff. And the reason why is because they were inspired by the Bible and the actions of Jesus. And so because of that, even though lepers had this horrendous, terrifying disease, they were still cared for incredibly well by the local communities who lived in and around them. And so there was a leper colony in and around St Mary's Place that continued till the Reformation. And it was actually quite far outside of Newcastle, because Newcastle would end where today you have Blackett Street. So where Blackett Street and North, um, sorry, Pilgrim Street and Northumberland Street join, there was a town gate there called the Pilgrim's Gate, and that was the northern part of Newcastle. Anything to the south of that was inside Newcastle, and this was all Northumberland at that time. So you can really see how the city's grown in the recent centuries. Following on from that, you've probably walked past this loads of times, but this is the South African War Memorial. And when this is the South African War Memorial, it remembers one of the Boer Wars. When it remembers the Boer Wars, these are one of the forgotten wars, because they happened about 14 years before the First World War, so no one really knows about them. But what happened was the South Africans who were descended from the Dutch settlers, the Boers, were across there and they revolted against the British Empire. And so the British Empire sent troops across to fight against them. And like all wars, it's really pointless and unpleasant and it was a really sad and terrible war. But one of the things that made it really dangerous for British soldiers was that the Boers were armed with British hunting rifles. And these hunting rifles were for big game. So they were for hunting things like buffalo, elephants, rhinos, that sort of thing. But they had a much larger range than the British soldiers' rifle. And so the Boers became famous as snipers. And they killed 370 soldiers from the Northumberland Fusiliers who were actually stationed over there. So this monument kind of remembers the soldiers who were killed during that war and conflict, which in many ways is a forgotten war. Hopefully I'm connected. We also have the two universities in this area, so going on to a much more, uh, well, happy story than that one I've just told you. We've got Newcastle University and Northumbria University, and I love telling stories of where these universities came from, because Newcastle University started in 1834 as a medical school, teaching just 26 students medical lectures. When they were teaching medical lectures, within one year of the college being set up, the two senior lecturers had an argument with each other, and they split into two rival institutions the Newcastle College of Medicine and the Medical College of Newcastle. 
when they split into these two rival institutions, the larger one joined with Durham University and then over time they grew until 1852 when it became Durham College of Medicine in Newcastle. They came back together and then it was a college of Durham University teaching medicine in Newcastle in the 1870s. In 1871, the College of Physical Sciences was also set up, and this was set up by the famous Lord Armstrong. So Lord Armstrong is famous today for his family owning Bamburgh Castle and also for Cragside in Northumberland, but he was a really interesting guy. His father was the mayor of Newcastle and he asked his dad at a young age if he could become an engineer, and his dad turned around and went, no, you're becoming a lawyer. And so he sent him to law school because his godfather owned a, uh, law, a law firm in Newcastle. His name was Armour Duncan and uh, basically studied law, then went and joined there and became a partner and practiced law until he was 40 years old. He then invented the pneumatic crane, which was the first crane in the entire world to use pneumatic pressure or water pressure to lift weights previously thought impossible. And when he invented that, it's the same technology today that we use in lifts. So if you've ever gone to lifts, it's the same technology that Lord Armstrong invented right back in the 18th, uh, well, in the mid 19th century. When he was doing that as well, he also invented one of the most efficient weapons of the 19th century, which was the Armstrong six pounder, which was an artillery piece that had nine times the range, five times the accuracy, and was three times lighter than any other artillery piece on the market. It then proceeded to go into action, and when it went into action, he then gave the patents to the British government. And he was given a million pounds back pay, it was made Baron Lord Armstrong, and then produced the guns down in the Woolwich Arsenal in London. But they couldn't produce enough guns, so he then produced another arms factory up here in Newcastle. When he had all of this money, he wanted to do philanthropy, so he set up the College of Physical Sciences here in Newcastle. And the College of Physical Sciences provided people to study engineering, uh, geology, chemistry, um, physics, um, ge ge uh, sorry, and, uh, and hard physical sciences, all up here in the northeast of England, to actually help out with the coal mining, shipbuilding, and heavy industries that were around this area. And so because of that, they then came together to form Armstrong College after his death in 1904, then in 1906 became King's College of Durham University, which continued to be its own independent college until 1963, when it became Newcastle University as we recognize it today. Now even though I went and studied at Newcastle, I actually love the story behind Northumbria more, because Northumbria was founded by a guy called John Hunter Rutherford, who is one of my heroes. He was born in the Scottish borders in Jedburgh, and his family were Presbyterians, and at about the age of 21 he came down here to Newcastle to become a preacher. And he was a preacher in the city and set up a small chapel down on Neville Street. So if you come out of Central Station, you'll see that just opposite Central Station there's a little Starbucks today. And roughly where that Starbucks is, is where he had his chapel in the base of a theatre. So they would go there, they would worship, but his congregation grew so rapidly that eventually he built his own church on Bath Lane near Newcastle's Chinatown. When he built that there, he was really passionate about education because this is uh, where uh, I always ask this question, but uh, what do you think uh, was the leaving age for school and when did it become um, legal that you had to, sorry, um, illegal that you couldn't take your kids out of school by a certain point? Does anyone have any ideas of what was the legal age for leaving school? and what year it was. Any guesses at all now? Eight years old in 1880. So in 1880 you could legally leave school at eight years old. And that's the first time in Europe there was a law that kids had to stay in school to a certain age. So in the northeast of England, people were actually taking their kids out of school way earlier because they wanted them to start working. And there was a massive issue. But John Hunter Rutherford knew that he could actually get kids educated. So he set up a Sunday school and he provided a free hot breakfast to any kid who attended. Within a couple of weeks he had 800 kids signed up. And then he repeated it in the east end of the city, in the north, in the west and in Gateshead. So that there were thousands of kids every single week getting an education and learning how to read and write. He then, following on from that, set up the uh, Rutherford School, which was for 12 to 14 year olds to get a further education so that they could actually get clerical jobs in and around the city. Then finally set up um, Rutherford College, which was for 16, sorry, 14 to 18 year olds to get a degree level education up and around here in the Northeast. Now, he actually passed away at the age of 58. And what's very amazing about him is he wasn't just a preacher, he was also um, a teacher and actually ran these schools himself and was also a medical doctor. And so he basically burned the candle at all ends, ran out of energy and died at 58. But he's still one of these amazing guys because the stuff that he set up still exists today. So the school 
is now a part of Excelsior Academy in the west end of Newcastle. Following on from that as well, the Rutherford uh, School that he set up is now Newcastle Sixth Form College, and the college that was set up is now Northumbria University. So around about 60,000 students a year get an education because one guy decided to give a free breakfast to local kids. And so he's one of my absolute heroes for that, and I think he's an amazing guy. And yet almost nobody knows about him, but at Northumbria University you can walk along and you still see the Rutherford Building, which is one of the few things named after him today. And in the big market as well, if you go to the top of the big market, you'll see a red fountain. That's the Rutherford Fountain, and one of my favourite things about it is it has written on it, uh, water is best. And it was a temperance fountain to give free water to people in Newcastle to stop them drinking beer when they were thirsty. So there's one for you there. What we'll do now is we'll head down Northumberland Street and I'll tell you a little bit more as we go on. But if you could all stay on my right hand side, it just makes it a wee bit easier for me to present the information. So we'll just head off. So right here, I'm going to guess that maybe lots of you have walked up and down the street loads of times but maybe never even noticed these stones right here. And these stones here are from buildings in Newcastle that no longer exist. Uh, they've been demolished over time. So one of them is actually, just over so there, you can see the YMCA. And the YMCA started off as a chapel, which roughly would be where the entrance to Eldon Square is, just next to the monument. And that chapel then became the YMCA and later on was demolished as Eldon Square was being uh, built. But alongside that as well, you've also got the Granger Arcade. So when you walk around Newcastle, obviously, you're around the Granger Town, and you'll see on most street signs, you'll see Granger Town written. And it's all named after one guy, Richard Granger. Granger's a really interesting guy because he had the vision to build a whole Granger Town uh, that you walk around. And as he built that town, he didn't make himself exactly popular because he demolished the old uh, Theatre Royal and built the new Theatre Royal. And so that caused a lot, in the council, a lot of people in the council to start becoming a bit angry against him and they've lost him a lot of political standing in the city. On top of this as well, he also built a massive arcade on what is now Pilgrim Street, where the Swan House Roundabout is today. And when he built this arcade, it was like an Eldon Square of its day. It had shops inside, it had its own bathhouse with a sauna, it had a, an auction house, and alongside that as well, uh, apartments in it too. It was massive. And when he built it, traditionally, Pilgrim Street had been the main street of Newcastle. You would walk up Pilgrim Street, and it's where most of the businesses were, and people wanted to be on Pilgrim Street. And that was the main route through. So he thought his arcade would always have businesses inside of it, would always be doing well, and it would go from strength to strength. But he wanted to build Central Station, and he put in a bid to the council to build Central Station down in Elsick. And when he did that, he bought four and a half acres of land on the quayside, and he said, right, we're going to build the central station down here. I'm going to build another section of Granger Town. It's going to be amazing. It'll be awesome. When he put that plan in, the council went against him and instead went with John Dobson. And when they went with John Dobson, they built Central Station where it was today, and this scuppered Granger. Because suddenly, the, the main street in Newcastle, ironically, was Granger Street, named after him, and then the route up to the monument. And so from there, you'd have around the monument, people wanted businesses around there, and his arcade basically sat there nearly empty. There were some businesses in, but it never really succeeded. And even in the 1800s, there were plans, sorry, the 1830s, uh, 40s, 50s, um, sort of that period there, there were plans to demolish it, but it somehow survived, got refurbished a couple of times, and it survived right the way through until the 1960s. And in the 1960s, you had a new leader of the council, and this guy was called T. Dan Smith, and he's quite an interesting character, because if you talk to some people in Newcastle, they spit blood whenever you say his name, and other people think him is a real visionary. But his, in his story is this, that he was born in 1900, and his parents were members of the British Communist Party. He had a very radical upbringing, and as he had this radical upbringing, he was a conscientious, conscientious objector in the First World War, and then between the wars, him and his dad had a painting company, and they earned themselves the nickname One Coat Dan, because he would put one coat of paint on council buildings and then disappear with the money. As he disappeared off with the money, then what happened next is that, obviously, they went through the, uh, the interwar period, and in the Second World War, he was actually a campaigner for international socialism before, after the war, so then after the war, he then joined Newcastle's council. 
And when he joined Newcastle's council, he rose up the ranks. And when he rose up the ranks, he eventually became the head of the council. And he was inspired by Brazil's new capital city, Brasilia, which was an entire city built out of concrete. And he wanted to do that here. He said he wanted a dream for Newcastle, and he called it the Brasilia of the North. So his dream was that all the ground level in Newcastle would just be for cars. And then every single building in Newcastle would be connected by walkways in the sky. And you can still see some of these walkways today. If you go into John Dobson Street, you can get onto the walkways and you can walk down to the quayside of them. And so it's an amazing sort of idea and dream that he had for the city in the sky. As he put this together, he also wanted to build a concrete platform between Newcastle and Gateshead and build 26 high-rises on it, named from A to Z after North East Saints. And on top of this as well, he was going to remodel the city and demolish a lot of the older buildings and replace them with these new high-rise structures. When he came up with this plan, the Granger Arcade, if you talk to some people, they say, oh, he always did plan to demolish it. But actually, his intent was to take it apart and then rebuild it because it was in a very bad state and he was going to refurbish it. So he took it apart brick by brick and he gave every single brick its own serial code and chalk. And then they put it in City Stadium in Sandyford. When they put it there, it rained and the chalk got washed off. And so because of that, some people stole some of the bricks and then other parts of it were used as foundations for the roads that you see around Sandyford and Heaton. And then other parts of it were then recycled into the new Eldon Square and into the Biker Wall. So if you're ever walking around Biker Wall and you see these wonderful Georgian pieces of sandstone, that's the old Granger Arcade. Now when you look at it here, there's some wonderful little parts of it. And some of these are people and some of these are ideas and I'll just explain them as we go on. So starting off, the three men that you have here, we've got over here Admiral Lord Collingwood, who was a British war hero in the Napoleonic War and was involved in the Battle of Trafalgar. Then you've got George Stevenson in the centre, obviously with his son they invented the rocket steam engine and was one of the first steam engines in the world. And then finally you have Thomas Buick, who was a naturalist, which isn't what it sounds like, he was an early biologist. So you've got him right there. And then the female characters are actually not people, but ideas. So you've got music represented down here with the female face with a harp. Then over there, you've got a female face with a bird underneath the chin. That there is peace. And so as we've got to obviously the dove is the international symbol of peace right there. Then over here, this is strength or bravery because in Greek legends, Hercules killed a lion and then from that, he then wore its cape. So that's the representation of bravery. But what we'll do now is we'll go slightly further up and I'll show you a couple more of them because they're amazing little bits of stone and you've probably walked, back tons of walked past tons of times. So right here, this is a selection of Roman and Greek gods. And I absolutely love this because the Victorians, even though they were a deeply oh, sorry, religious society, were also um, actually very big fans of the Romans and the Greeks. So they copied a lot of their ideas and they would put them around towns and cities. So when they put them around towns and cities, to start off with here, that is Victory. Uh, or as you might know her better by her Greek name, Nike. Because the guy who created the um, shoe company, he actually wanted to name it after something uh, that people would want to buy. And because lots of people had a classical education back then, he thought, well, oh, everyone wants to have you know, victory on their feet, so they'll buy my shoes because they're called Nike. But uh, that's victory right there, and you can normally tell because she's got a pen underneath her chin, which obviously is, means you know, sort of history is written by the victors, and she's also got a laurel wreath on her head as well. Then, following up from there, this is the Roman and Greek goddess of fortified cities. Unfortunately, I can't remember her name, but she's right there. And then just over here, this is Bacchus, the Roman and Greek god of wine. And uh, so he's right there. Then in the top there, that's Neptune, representing Bar the Tyne, or the River Tyne. And this is wonderful, because if you go around the city, there's a lot of representations of the river. So on the side of the council building, there's the river god there. Down on the old fish market on the quayside, which is obviously now a nightclub, you've got a representation of him again above the entrance. And he's in other parts of the cities as well. 
Uh, so when he's in around the city, he there represents everything to do with the River Tyne. So if you look at his hair, in his hair he's got fish and wheat or grain, and that represents the bounty of the river coming off the river from as far as Hexham, where you've got grain coming down the river, you've got fish, all of that sort of thing there. On top of that, behind his ears, he's got spades, uh, spades and pickaxes representing coal mining. And then on his head, that's not a crown, it's actually a basket of coal. And so that right there is a coal basket representing the coal coming off the river as well. And so he represents the river and the city, and he's one of the river gods. Then right here as well, we've also got the symbol of Newcastle, which is well, so the animal symbol of Newcastle, which is the seahorse, or the hippocampus in Latin. So when you've got that, uh, London has an animal as well, it's a dragon, York has a wild boar, and Newcastle has a seahorse representing international trade. And so when I showed this off uh, last year, I had a guy believe that this was actually to do with Newcastle United, because underneath there is the city's motto, which in Latin translates into English as uh, triumphant in defense. My Latin's not good enough for me to feel full confident to say that, um, just in Latin. But triumphant in defense actually comes from the English Civil War because Newcastle fought on the royalist side during the Civil War and Newcastle was besieged for nine months by the uh, parliamentarians and then was captured by the parliamentarians and then later on Charles I was captured and brought here to Newcastle and he stayed here for 12 months as a private citizen. When he stayed here for 12 months, he basically gave the city his motto saying they were triumphant in defense because even though they had suffered for nine months under siege, they still held out. So it's nothing to do with Newcastle United, and I kind of wish it was, because we could do with being triumphant in defence, but that's another matter entirely. So that right there is the symbol of the city, and I just love showing off these little stones, because you get a little bit more of the history of the city than you might not have noticed otherwise. So we'll just head down off on Street, and I'll tell you a little bit more as we go on. a way of trying to bring Christianity back to people in cities and actually make it a little bit more of a, an accessible religion for people. And it was obviously led by Wesley and it was called Wesleyism at the start. And some of the big ideas behind it was the idea that you would also use entrepreneurship to try and help people by creating businesses and all of that sort of stuff. You'd focus on education and healthcare and then try and help these urban areas that were really str struggling with mass poverty. So when they were trying to help with all of these things, an orphanage here was seen as a massive thing and the Methodist orphanage was run by his brother who actually came up here to run the orphanage. When he came up to Newcastle to run the orphanage, many children in Newcastle lost their parents to the terrible like, lifestyle that could be happening within big city centres, could then get an education in here and then be helped to set up their own businesses so they'd employ people and then reduce poverty in city centres. And on the front of the building there are four characters representing virtues that the Methodists held closely on to. So in the bottom right hand corner is Roger Thornton. And Roger Thornton is often described as Newcastle's Dick Whittington. Apparently he walked into Newcastle through the West Gate with a halfpenny and a lambskin and then set up business here. The actual reality of it is that he was the fourth son of a wealthy Northumberland gentleman and he received a packet of money to set up in business from his father. When he set up in business with, uh, in Newcastle, he eventually became Mayor of Newcastle numerous times as well as Member of, Her Member of Parliament in Newcastle numerous times, and so he was really doing quite well. And when he was doing quite well, he actually helped hold Newcastle against the Percys, who are now famous for their castle, Annick Castle. When he held Newcastle against the Percys, he used his own money to buy weapons for the town guard and to fortify the city again, and Newcastle held out against Percy forces. So because of that, he was awarded their lands in Yorkshire and became a landed gentleman himself. And so he represents business and entrepreneurship. Then above him is his, his enemy, if you like, Harry Hotspur. And Harry Hotspur is a member of the Percy family who revolted against Henry IV. 
they cited the reason was that Henry IV was seen as a bit of a tyrant by the nobles in Britain at that time. So because of that, they revolted against him. And when they revolted against him, Harry Hotspur was descended from an English princess. So because of that, he had royal blood in his veins, and he would have become king of England had he won this revolt. So because of that, he was then fighting, and he died in Chester fighting against royalist forces, which caused their campaign to end. But before he died, he was often seen as the most popular knight in Europe and was the pure example of living chivalry. So because of that, that's why he's there. He represents chivalry and needing to fight when you have to, but not like aggressively, but defensively. And then you've got Thomas Buick. Thomas Buick was a scientist um, called a naturalist, as I mentioned before. He actually went out and he did a history of British birds. So he drew and painted every single bird in Britain and put together a book. And he's also famous for doing history of four-legged animals, which is actually quite funny to see today because during his lifetime he had never ever seen a lion or an elephant or stuff like that. So he was doing them from descriptions and they are hilarious. And when they are hilarious, you can actually sort of see those, but it's amazing just to see me at least try. One of the, forest, one of the funny stories, what I'm actually do is I'm going to take it slightly further down just because obviously and there's a wee protest there and so uh, you can just hear me. As the mayor of Newcastle during the English Civil War, what happened was that um, basically the city was besieged and he was on the royalist side. So he fought for the royalists against the parliamentarians. Now for nine months, as I mentioned before, Newcastle suffered a brutal siege and a single ship ran the parliamentary and blockade and got into Newcastle and they had Carling's lippies inside and they unloaded them into the city and all that Newcastle had to be linked for the remainder of the siege was Carling's lippies. Then when they ate that, um, what happened was obviously Newcastle then fell to parliamentary attack after a three-day brutal city fight where they went street by street and then he fled to the castle and held out for another three days until he heard that time map fell. Then he immediately surrendered to the parliamentarians. He went straight over to them and asked for protection. And the reason why he asked for protection was because he knew the people of Newcastle were out to get him. During the time he was mayor of Newcastle, £800,000 of the town's money ended up his own private bank account. So he's quite an interesting character and I don't know if he should represent politicians up there, but he is supposed to represent politics. So if you think he represents politics really well, that's entirely down to you. But if not, I think he's quite an interesting character nevertheless. So we'll just take the bottom of the street and I'll tell you a little bit more as we go on. If you've been around the city centre for a while, you'll have noticed the stack is no longer here. It's obviously been taken down, and obviously before then there was the Odeon Cinema, and now they're building an office for HMRC. So there's going to be 8,000 uh, HMRC staff living and uh, so working around this area, and they're hoping a few of them will move into the city centre as well. And so as they move around here, the building I want to focus on is the white structured building with the steel frame out the front of it. That's the old offices of Nesco. So just to give you an idea, back in 1900, Newcastle was a massive industrial city. Britain as a whole produced 284 million tons of coal a year. And Newcastle produced about 60 million tons of that. So when 60 million tons of coal was coming out of here, Newcastle also had three city centre power stations. And Newcastle produced 30 times more electricity than the rest of Britain put together. Because of that, in the interwar period, they set up two um, power companies, Nesco and Disco. So the North East Electrical Power Company and the District Power Company. When these two companies were set up, Disco didn't survive, but Nesco did. And it grew to have 300,000 customers and was really, really successful to the point where they could build a wonderful city centre office. And they put the facade of the building with Portland stone. Portland stone is quarried down in Dorset and it's a self-cleaning stone. As long as it's exposed to wind and rain, it cleans itself. And so you've got this wonderful structure here. And then just past it is the old fire station and police station, which also as well is covered with the same, um, the same um, material. And the amazing thing about both of those together is that they are wonderful examples of interwar architecture. Now today, um, what happened was Nesco was eventually nationalized and then sold off. And today you can recognize it as the business E.ON, or at least the British side of it is now E.ON and Britain. So I love telling that story. 
The other thing I love to show off around here is just here where you have northern goldsmiths. And where you have northern goldsmiths, you actually have a wonderful statue on the top of this. And this statue right here, apparently according to local stories, is connected to it, well, is being sung about in the song by the band Lindisfarne. And the band Lindisfarne, <clears throat> they actually wrote a song where it's called Meet Me on the Corner. And apparently it's about this, and about dating in Newcastle. Though I have to sort of uh, say that this is sort of a bit more of an urban story rather than rote. But apparently when people would meet for dates in the past, they would gather on this corner and the lyrics of the song go, meet me on the corner when the lights are going low and I'll be there, I promise I'll be there. And this goes back to obviously before, where we had, before we had instantaneous messaging. So today, obviously, all of us can expect to send a text message to someone and get a response back maybe in a minute or two saying, oh yeah, I'll meet you there, or you know, I'm just gonna be late or something like that. And so we're used to that today. But obviously in the past, that's not always been the case. You had to agree a time and a place to meet. And so many people in Newcastle would meet underneath the clock here of Northern Goldsmiths. And this would be the area they'd go for dates. And then from here they'd set off into the city because the song goes and out into the, like down the empty streets and into the night will disappear. And so then that reflects the idea of going off for a date. And so apparently this was where they met. And last year when I was doing this tour, I had a lady who came up to me afterwards and she said to me, oh, actually it's true. Me and my husband came here for our first date and later on we got married, but this is where we met. But just so you know, that's not what we called it when we were young. Apparently the nickname, and I can say this because of these, there's no kids around, but the colloquial name for it was actually Fanny on Corner. And if you look at the anatomy of the statue, you'll maybe understand why they nicknamed it that, but that's just for you in your own time. So I love that little bit of sort of modern history that could be lost because now we're used to the idea of instantaneous communication, but it's a wonderful bit of folk story in Newcastle that I love to preserve and tell them to us. So what we'll do now is we'll head to the monument and I'll tell you a little bit about the story of Earl Grey when we go there. American War of Independence. When he fought against the Americans, obviously we lost that war, but Parliament still wanted to honour him, so he made him Charles Grey, 1st Earl Grey. And when he was made Charles Grey, 1st Earl Grey, he then went on to send his son to Eton and to Cambridge University, and then after that, he then went on his grand tour, which is when a young gentleman was expected to travel through all the major cities in Europe and have a party in each one to learn about European culture. So because of that, he was having a great time parting his way through Europe, all paid for by dad, and finishing in Venice. So he sets off and he's having a great time parting his way through Europe when the Member of Parliament from Newcastle and Northumberland passes away. And his father says, well, Charles will stand for election. And without even being in a city or in a country, he is elected as Newcastle's Member of Parliament. He doesn't even find out until he comes back to the country, gets off the boat and his dad greets him, and he then takes up his seat as Newcastle's Member of Parliament. And he's just 21 years old. He's the youngest Member of Parliament. And when he does that, he then serves in the government and becomes Foreign Secretary. And after his father's death, he actually becomes um, a Charles Grey's second Earl Grey. And when he becomes Charles Grey's second Earl Grey, he then goes on to be an ambassador for British interests around the world. And there's a number of different myths and legends about where Earl Grey tea comes from. One of the most popular ones is that Lady Grey did not like the flavour of the water on the estate in uh, Howick in Northumberland. But another one that I've come across is that apparently a Chinese merchant um, was uh, wanted to give Earl Grey a gift and so gave him a cup of tea that he could enjoy. He enjoyed it so much he took it to London Tea Company Twinings and they recreated it as Earl Grey tea. I'm not entirely sure which one's true, there's a lot of different stories there, but at least at how we call they go with the Lady Grey one. But at the same time, there's lots of different stories out there. He then went through his political career, Britain went through the Napoleonic War, and the Napoleonic War was really brutal for Britain. And at the end of it, people really wanted more rights, more freedoms, that sort of thing. And in 1830, there was an election, and the Liberal Party, the Whigs, had a landslide victory, and Earl Grey was invited to become Prime Minister. 
When he became Prime Minister, he passed a huge reform act. Well, two massive reform acts for the country. The first one is the Great Reform Act right here, which is remembered for the monument. And he increased the number of voters in the country from 200,000 to 707,000. And while there's a wee bit more nuance, the basic thing was that you only had the right to vote if your ancestor in the Middle Ages had the right to vote. Earl Grey changed it so that every man over the age of 25 with more than 10 pounds of a property got the right to vote. Which is like today, only a house, maybe around about 300,000 pounds, outright no mortgage. So you can understand, it definitely wasn't democracy as we understand it today, but it was the beginning of modern day democracy. The second thing he did, which was equally as important, was the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. Because there are millions of people bought and sold as casually as we drink tea and coffee today. When they were bought and sold casually as we drink tea and coffee, um, do apologize for a moment. Earl Grey absolutely. I'll bring it slightly closer just to the modern capacity to make sure it passed. But what they did is they purchased every single slave in the British Empire for £10 million in old money, which in today's money is around £48 million. Sorry, £48 million, £590 million. Now, to put this in context, the entire debt for the Second World War was £22 million. So it was more than double the cost of the Second World War. So when you look at it there, that really just shows you how much it cost, and it took us until 2016 to pay off the debt. There were still people receiving money for their ancestors' slaves right up until 2016. So when you look at Earl Grey, he's an amazing character because many people look at him and they just think he's the tea girl. But he's actually one of our most important politicians for both civil rights and alongside that, the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. During his lifetime, though, he wasn't much appreciated. And when he died, his carriage carrying his coffin was actually stoned on the way to his funeral because of the fact that so many... Um, people disliked him because the people who had been anti-slavery said not a single penny should have been spent in the abolition of the slave trade while on the other side those who had actually owned the slaves now had lost their, um, their free labour so it's an interesting one would you be so committed to what you believe in that you would fight for it for your entire life knowing that you wouldn't be like the Newcastle medley it sounds great but it does make a tour guide's job a little bit harder let's go round to the door of the monument now and I'll let you in and have a, a take up to the top